Which Ibatunde? Ibatunde. Is it bad? No, he's not today. He's Ibatunde in the room. No, he's No, I mean, okay, if, I, if he's not here. Okay, let's start. <clears throat> Welcome back after the coffee break. Uh, we have three talks in this session, except that we are not sure about the third speaker, Zoltan Toroshkai. Uh, is he in the audience? I mean, he's been seen in the hotel, but he's not yet been seen over here. All right, uh, anyhow, we, there may be some small changes later on. Uh, let's start now with Nilima Gupte from the IIT Madras, and she'll speak on micro transitions in hierarchical and climate networks. Nilima. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Yeah. Do you have is this thing hanging on? Yes. Is it blue? Is it blue? Yeah, yeah. blue? Okay. <coughs> so I'm going to first I'm going to actually talk of micro transition in two different contexts. The two different contexts which I'm going to talk about is in the context of avalanche dynamics on ranking hierarchical networks. I'm going to use microtransitions, which I will define shortly, in order to make predictions for critical values at which transitions can be, phase transitions can be seen in these networks. And I, what I'm going to try doing is, is to apply this to a practical problem. And the practical problem is the problem of climate networks, since Yukin has already given the first talk. <laughs> There's always been a very nice introduction to what climate networks are. So I won't have to spend too much time on it, although my networks are in blue. So first, the branching hierarchical network. And here are two pictures of branching hierarchical network. So the left, left network is an obvious one. It's a respiratory network. You can see that the, that the vertical line, the top vertical line is the trachea and it branches off, and it branches off still further. And uh, as, as we know, the alveoli gets smaller and smaller. So that's an example of a branching network. And on the right, there are branching networks in physiological systems. There are branching networks in, in natural systems. So on the right, you see a river network. And this is the river Googly, which is of the ones we have, this is the best example of a branching network. So when we say branching hierarchical, by from the pictures it must be obvious what we mean. We talk of a network of links and nodes that has a central backbone or trunk. And essentially branches emerge from this backbone and branch further. And uh, we are going to use this network. This network will actually carry out some function or support a dynamical process. And we already saw 
got two examples of uh, axial branching wires with hierarchical networks. And uh, there are many examples of engineered networks. There are fast rates, there are computer networks, there are traffic networks, which can all, which all have this same structure. <coughs> I'm now going to discuss a branching hierarchical network in the context of a specific model. And people who work in granular media will realize that this is related to the Caucasus model of granular media. Remember that I'm going to also talk about microtransition. So in the context, microtransition is the first thing in the context of percolation. This is a fairly recent result around 2013 or so. Also, uh, a number of people, Susan Nagler and others, had actually seen these microtransitions in the context of percolation networks. And essentially, these are seen at locations of the control parameter where functions of the order parameter, which is small but abrupt changes. And these changes actually accumulate at the axial phase. So we are going to use this not in the population context. We are going to use this branching hierarchical natural lattice, which I'm going to use this in a minute. And uh, I'm going to use this for avalanche transmission and this. I'm also going to use this for climate networks. I'll postpone this discussion. <laughs> I'm going to show you a picture <coughs> of the actual model network which we are going to see. So what we have here is the model network. So you can see that there is a triangular lattice over here. And uh, essentially the way the links on the lattice go is that from the top layer, the sites on the top layer, any site on the top layer can link to either one of its two nearest neighbors in the layer below with a probability <laughs> So in fact, there are, you can see how the network has formed over here. What, what you see here is one realization of the network. And it's obvious that there will be two to the end realizations of this network. Uh, I've added a small wrinkle to this, this network, which is that uh, this was initially defined, defined in the context of load-bearing networks. And what we say is that each one of the sites on top is going capable of taking load one. <laughs> okay. And the load, the, the capacity of the loads actually changes as you go down the network and it changes according to the way in which the network is linked. So for example, <laughs> you can see here that this site has capacity one, this site has capacity one, this site which is linked to both these has capacity one plus one plus its own capacity three. And it goes on this way downwards. Okay? So as you go downwards, the capacity <coughs> of the sites increases. And uh, this is the hierarchy. So like we said, there are two to the end possible realizations. <coughs> now I'm going to discuss a special realization. So if you look at this realization, you see that out of the 10 to the 2 to the n realizations, there will be two realizations like this. One of them, so you can see that the special thing about this realization is that uh, all the lattices in the top layer, all the sites in the top layer, actually are linked to this, are actually involved in this maximal cluster. And this is what we call the V lattice for obvious reasons. That is because the two arms actually form a V. So you can have a V like this, or you can have a V which goes the other way. Okay? And uh, so this is what, there are two possible realizations. And one thing which I would say is that uh, this is the largest maximum cluster. And it also links up the largest number of sites. So this cluster actually has the largest capacity of all the possible realizations. We now start something which is called the avalanche process on both these lattices which we have defined. So what do we mean by the avalanche process? Okay, <coughs> something very simple. Suppose we take some test wave and we deposit it somewhere in this top layer. Okay. So let's say if I take some test wave, let's say three, <coughs> and that's deposited over here. This site has capacity one, so it will take capacity one. There are two left. It will go to this capacity. It will go to this site again, and then this site has capacity 2, so all the test weight will be, will be absorbed over here. So 
that's an example of an avalanche transmission, and that is a subjective one. Suppose you instead take a larger capacity. Suppose you take a larger test load. Then these sites, it may happen that you may come all the way down, <laughs> and uh, you may still have leftover waste. One thing which we do is to put it back in the top layers, but then some of these sites are already saturated. So it may happen that this kind of uh, transmission may finally come to a site which has already sat saturated its capacity, and the transmission has nowhere to go, in which case the transmission fails. So that's as far as transmission is concerned, as far as the avalanche process is concerned. And what we define now is an order parameter and that order parameter essentially consists of the fraction of subsection transition. Okay? That means if you, at a given test weight, <laughs> you deposit it arbitrarily somewhere on the top layer, which means it can access different clusters, how often does it reach the bottom? So you can obviously see that that actually will be a function of the test weight. So for small test weights, essentially every transmission is successful. And as test weights increase, essentially every transition fails. So there is a transition phase transition which takes place somewhere at this point. So this picture which I show you is for arbitrary realization. Okay. That means we said that there are two kinds of realizations, that there are two to the n realizations, of which we said two are special. This is for any arbitrary realization, not for the sequential <coughs> realization. Those who are familiar with phase transitions can see that uh, it looks quite nicely like the way the order parameter behaves for the second order phase transition. If on the other hand, we start looking at the real activity, that is the special realization, you can see that the transition is quite abrupt. Because essentially there are only two possible maximum clusters. Okay? And once their capacity is saturated, the transitions this is a straightforward example of what we call a first order transition or a dictation. We did a lot of work with this, but that is not today's story. Today's story is about macro transition. So what we look at is, we've already defined the order parameter for this. What I define for you over here is the variance of the order parameter. So this is the order parameter squared, average over order realization parameter against the order parameter average squared. And this, of course, is the relative variance. So we test this quantity for, look, we look at what is called the, we look at the, at the critical realization, namely the V-lattice. I'll tell you, if I have time, I'll tell you later why we call it a critical realization. Uh, this is tested in a certain way. What you see is this series of very well-ordered fluctuations in the variance, okay? all of which accumulate at this point. What are we interested in? We are interested in the locations at which these peaks in the variance occur. If we look at the locations at which the peaks in the variance occur, we find uh, if we look at a quantity, which is the difference between the locations of successive peaks divided by the location of the earlier peak, and on the i on the x-axis we plot the label of the peak times a factor, which enables the data to collapse to co collapse now nicely. And what we really see is that all the data actually puts a nice problem. done in an ordered way, if you don't do it in an order way, in a, if you do it in a random way, you still get the same results, you get nice scaling behavior, and uh, what we see here is that uh, all that was for the nice lens, that was for the B lens, the things come in a very ordered way, which is why we saw a very nice ordered series of things. If you actually look at typical realizations, they don't come in a certain, certain order. So you see that the pattern of fluctuations which you see is 
not so rare, is not so regular. But you still see these peaks in the variance, and you still see a point at which this attributes. Okay. What we see here is here also there is scaling to this. Okay. That is, if we look at the critical value of at which the transition occurs and its separation from the location of the I plus one is three divided by again the location of the critical of the critical value minus the critical of the by minus the location of the I three, you see that it shows a nice behavior which is <coughs> like this, which is in fact almost a point. So this is for the what we call this is for the typical realization. What do we mean with this? So the scaling behavior, the fact that these transitions actually follow a scaling behavior, can actually be put to good use. So this is the scaling relation which we found for the DVI. Okay. Once we find the scaling relation and we find these constants, we can actually predict the value at which the transition takes place. Okay. And from the scaling relation above, this is the relation which is actually, this is the value at which the transition takes place. If you look at the order parameter plot, then from the order parameter plot, you can also see the point at which the transition takes place. And you can see that the two corroborate each other reasonably nicely. So you have been able to predict the value at which the transition takes place from the scaling relation. You can do this for the other case also, which is for the typical realization. So here also, from the graph, you can figure out the constant. That turns out to be this. And you do the scaling relation. You find the typical value, and that is this one. And if you actually calculate the susceptibility and find the typical value from there, you find this value, which again, I believe, should be there. So the point is, the microtransitions can actually be used, the value at which the transition so this was nice. <laughs> this was nice. On the branching hierarchical lattice, we could do it for both the cases. Both the case where there was a second order transition, the case where there was a first, the where there was a first order transition. But what we wanted to see was whether we could actually use this in order to make predictions in any kind of realistic way. So in fact, uh, fortunately, I don't have to spend a lot of time introducing this because we will use this in the and what we did was we constructed a climate network which is based on near surface air temperature data which is collected at the grid point of a geographic grid based on latitude and line longitude values. So the data set, this is the data set we just analyzed and this is freely available at this ECMWF site. So here is the actual site from which we got the data set. And what we got was the data set for daily near surface air temperature within the period 1979 to 2018, which was last year. And you can have this here. For n equal to 726 nodes, that is latitude and longitude points, at a grid resolution of 7.5 degrees. It's very nice that this huge data is actually freely available. Uh, we constructed the climate network using the filtered daily surface air temperature at one atmosphere and constructing the cross scale matrix. Uh, I should have mentioned something here that this is the method of Pavlov's okay. And uh, this was proposed, I think, in 2014. I should have really written down that I think as we would say in 2014. So, what do we do here? This is the mean temperature. This temperature is the mean temperature on a, in a given year on a given day, okay. and this is the this is the temperature. Uh, yeah, this uh, and this mean is the average for that day over all the years for which we have the data available. Okay. And what we have in the denominator is the standard deviation. So we construct this quantity two y of t, and we define the cross correlation in the standard way, except that. The cross-correlation, <coughs> the labels here, these are at different grid points. 
So remember that these are grid points on the globe. <coughs> I'll show you a picture in a few minutes. Okay. And this is the year, so this is the location. This is another location. These are for the same year. And these are for two different days. So this is for a given day and this is for a day before. Okay. So using this, we construct this cross correlation function. There's a time lag of 0 to 200 days. I'll tell you later why 0 to 200 days. And what we do is to define, is to connect the network according to the cross correlation. Okay. So the linked weight is added, the linked weight is defined. So remember that there are, there's a time lag of 200 values. Uh, there's a time lag of 200 days, so there are 200 values. We just take the largest of them. We take the maximum of the cross correlation. And we add links to the network one by one depending yes. according to the least weight. That is, we first add the link with the highest weight and select edges ordered by decreasing weight. Now what are we looking for? We are looking for the percolation transition on this climate network. Okay. So how do we define the percolation transition on this climate network? We look for the existence of a percolation transition via the order parameter, namely the existence of a giant cluster which contains order n nodes. So essentially the same definition which we have in the case of percolation. So here is our picture, these are the grid points, this is a higher value of C, so this is for 1981, this is for a value of C which is equal to 0.7 which is high, so you can see that at this high value there are few links. As you come down to the next value which is C is equal to 0.5, then for the lower value as you, as you come down the number of links exceeds, I mean number of links obviously increases because you're coming down from higher values to lower values. So you can actually see that as we come down to lower values, the number of links increases. And you can actually <coughs> see that the links, the way in which the links come in different regions of the globe, they actually show up nicely. Which is again something which we saw from the previous slide. Right? So here is the order parameter. This is the size of the largest connected cluster the susceptibility, which is S squared and it's actually S squared is, we have not included the largest cluster, so that gives you the fluctuation. And uh, what I'm showing you here is the susceptibility for certain protein data. The susceptibility is being shown <coughs> as a function of the, as a function of the link state, maybe. So you can see that there is a place where there is a large amount of susceptibility. And in fact, there are many places where there are giant susceptibility. Which obviously are places where the order parameter has changed. So these are the places where the multi transitions are taking place. So here are the jumps in the susceptibility, delta chi. And this is the cross correlation and this is the this is the C value, and you can see that there is a series of them. Here is the scaling relation. It essentially looks like what we saw earlier. From here, we can actually again predict the CC, the C sub C, which is 0.5, which is 0.4669. We can also compare it with what was obtained from the order parameter, and there is reasonable equivalence. But remember now, we are no longer working with a model, this is real data. So what does this show us? What this tells us is that there are very typical values of CC, okay, which uh, what we were, what how his first initial data tried to do was they were trying to predict the El Nino phenomenon. So what do micro transitions tell you about the El Nino phenomenon? So typically when you have the El Nino phenomenon, you start looking for indicators here. You want to actually predict the El Nino. So you want to know something about it before the El Nino. So you want to look for the pattern. Remember that we are doing the pattern year by year. Okay. So you want to say something in the year before El Nino. Okay. So you actually 
actually, so this in fact is a table of indicators. CC is only one indicator. I probably won't have the time to tell you about the others. What we see here is that years, these, uh, these years that you see here are the indicator years. And what you see below is are in fact the, L, are the years in which El Nino shows. Okay. What we see here is that for El Nino years, for, for pre-El Nino years, for indicator years, the values of CC actually lie between 0.44 and 0.47. You see values like that, then you can be reasonably confident that the next year is actually going to be an El Nino. And what we saw was that in all the years that we looked at the data, there is only one fault point. So I'll show you that. So you can see everywhere the indicator years. You of course have to see if you can look at the susceptibility jump. Okay. Also, this is not from the CC, but this is from the susceptibility jump. So that's another way of looking at whether there's going to be an LD. If it exceeds a certain threshold, maybe this one, you can say the next year is going to be an LD. So this is only one point. Okay. Thank you, Nilima. Questions? Jürgen. Uh, what is the prediction horizon? How much earlier do you predict? One and, hmm? As a more than seven months. No, no, no. Uh, what are you talking about? Uh, how many uh, months in advance? Yeah. Comfortably. Comfortably seven months in advance. Yeah, but this is the old, the well known. Barrier, the seven months barrier. Can you go also beyond? Probably. See. That would be very interesting. Probably, because if you actually see, then uh, you can go to quite early transition mm -hmm. hmm, and predict the CC value. Okay. So we have not pushed it so hard. See, the climate <laughs> application, we have not really pushed that much. 
Okay. A question here. Hey, thank you. So, yeah, this question is related to, to the previous question. So, for El Nino, there are proxies like um, ocean temperature and also regional climate models do a good work predicting El Nino. So, can you do better than that? Have you compared with predictions coming from regional climate? Next speaker is Janestra Bianconi, and uh, she will speak on emergent hyperbolic network geometry and frustrated synchronization. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here among so many friends and new people to meet. Uh, today I want to tell you about uh, uh, emergent hyperbolic network geometry and dynamics. In the context of complex networks, there has been a big uh, understanding about the interplay between network structure and dynamic function. But recently, uh, question related to network topology and network uh, geometry are coming into play. And in fact, uh, um, it is very important to understand, for instance, um, brain networks with tools of uh, topology and geometry like this uh, manifold that you see there. And network topology is important to understand uh, the hidden metrics of network or also the the mathematical uh, basis behind the mesoscale structure of complex networks. In order to tackle questions related to network topology and geometry, uh, we need to um, abandon the single network framework and to study generalized network structure. And you might have heard about uh, multilayer networks that encode information about uh, in which um, the network is, as, um, uh, is formed by a set of nodes and different type of interaction. And uh, here I make a shameless advertisement of uh, the book that I've been working on in the last year. But here I want to tell you about another generalized network structure, which are simplicial complexes. And simplicial complexes are not only formed by nodes and links like network, uh, but also by triangles, tetrahedra and so on. And these are being constructed by this geometrical building block, our ideal structure to uh, understand network geometry. And as such, they've been used extensively, for instance, in the context of quantum gravity, well, where people uh, think or approximate uh, space-time with a discrete uh, structure. But recently, these networks have been very important also to understand uh, uh, brain research, for instance, 
where you have, for instance, three regions of the brain and you want to distinguish this scenario in which the three regions are pairwise correlated, so indicated by a triangle of three links, or they are activated at the same time, and this is indicated by a triangle, field triangle that is distinguished from the other pressure. Also, other examples of simplicial complexes are, for instance, protein interaction network, where you have protein forming protein complexes formed by more than two different type of proteins. So we have to go behind the uh, pairwise interaction framework or in social network and collaboration network. If you have a paper, not always a paper is formed by uh, two, simply two author or a movie might have more than two main actors. But here I want to link this uh, study of the topology of simplicial complex to dynamics. And in particular, my inspiration is a work that we have da done together with some neuroscientists in CISA, which were studying the correlation in neuronal culture formed by a neuron grown in 2D slice or in 3D scaffold. And it, 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 the result is that if you compare the correlation matrix in 2D slice or in 3D scaffold, you find that 3D boosts uh, synchro uh, syn synchronization correlation between the neurons. So here really there is an interplay between natural geometry and dynamics. So, um, so I, the, the talk will be structured in three main topics. One is a network model of uh, emergent uh, network geometry. Another is about uh, putting dynamics, and in particular, a Kuramoto dynamics on top of them. And then I will speak about also recent results that we have in percolation. And the common theme is the role of different dimension um, in addressing this, this question. So the first question is emergent geometry. So we want to have a framework that describe uh, a network which has a clear geometrical structure starting from dynamical rules that are purely combinatorial. So they are uh, independent on the network geometry. And as such, we want to understand how uh, from, from, let's say, let's purely combinatorial stochastic model we can generate an emergent geometry, and we will see that this geometry is hyperbolic. So first of all, let me just uh, indicate a little bit of notation. So a simplex, a zero simplex is a node, a one simplex is a link, a two simplex is a triangle. So it's a, a simplex is a set of d plus one nodes, where d is the dimension of the simplex, and indicate the interaction between the nodes and admits a geometrical interpretation as triangle, tetrahedral, and so on. Then we will speak about phases. So the phases of a tetrahedral, for instance, are all the nodes, the four nodes that form that, the six links, and the four triangles that form that. And a simplicial complex is just a, a set of simplices such that if a simplex M belongs to the simplicial complex, also all its faces belong to the simplicial complexes. And so we, we will um, generalize the notion of degree with generalized degree. So the generalized degree of uh, um, a face will be uh, the delta will be the number of d-dimensional simplices incident to the delta dimensional phase mu. So for instance, k210 mu is the number of triangle incident to the node mu, because the node is zero dimensional, the triangle are two dimensional. k21 is the number of triangle incident to the link mu. So for instance, in this picture, you will have node three incident to four triangles, so it has a generalized degree four, or the link one three incidents to three triangles, so you will have a generalized degree three. And from the generalized degree, we define an incidence number, which is the generalized degree minus one, and so for instance, this link will have a generalized uh, incidence number two. 
So it's easy to realize that a necessary condition to have manifold is that a link is incident at most to two triangle, for instance, if you live in 2D, so that manifold will have uh, incidence number between zero and one only. So for instance, this object is not a manifold, while here every link is incident at most to two triangle, it is a manifold. And in three dimension, you should have a, a triangle incident at most to two tetrahedra and so on. So we built a growing network model, uh, which we call network geometry with flavor, which generalize uh, simplician network growing model, which generalize growing network model, and includes grow and a more method of attachment. So we start from a single d-dimensional simplex. We have a grow at every time step. We add a new d-dimensional simplex uh, to a d minus one phase. And the attachment depends on this flavor, which take value minus one, zero, and one, and is given by this, this uh, attachment kernel. So if we look closely at this attachment kernel, we see that for flavor minus one, this probability is proportional to one minus the incidence number. So the probability will be non-zero only if the incidence number is zero. And as soon as the incident number is one, we cannot any longer attach a d-dimensional simplex to it. So we will only form manifold in this way. For s equal to zero, we will have uniform attachment. So the incident number can take any value. And for s equal to one, we have a generalized preferential attachment, meaning uh, the more d-dimensional simplexes are attached to a face, the more I want to attach to a face. So we can study the, the, the distribution of this structure, and we find this the result, this strong dependence on the dimensionality of the object. In particular, if we have preferen generalized preferential attachment, these NGF are always scale-free. But for uniform attachment, as long as we are in dimension D greater than one, then these NGF are scale-free. This is because if you attach a triangle uniformly to every link, we end up attaching a link to a node proportionally to how, to how many links it has already. So it is a, an emergent preferential attachment due to dimensionality. And if uh, we have a manifold, as long as our, our we are in dimension D greater than two, so if we are in dimension three and above, then we get a scale-free graph. But here um, I promise you to tell you about emergent geometry. So if we have the same length associated to every node, this network are small words, so we cannot embed it into an Euclidean space. But and so, so this is our, the, the result from the degree distribution simulation, which match very closely. And this is the geometric embedding. So we start one, with the initial triangle, and then we uh, place triangle to the links, and this form this uh, growing pattern which uh, um, lives in this uh, 2D hyperbolic space and this uh, uh, random ferry graph um, in this and this uh, and form this uh, very uh, geometrical uh, network structure. And then we can do the same in 3D, so we can place this tetrahedra in a 3D ball uh, representing uh, with the hyperbolic matrix, and we can place tetrahedra on top, on the face of this tetrahedra. And interesting, we find this structure which lives in this hyperbolic uh, space. And this structure has this property that if we forgot about the volume of this object, and, uh, and we, the nodes are only on the surface, and we can project the node on the surface. Uh, and if we interpret now the surface in an Euclidean uh, metric, we find uh, what we recognize as a random Apollonian graph. So this um, rules that was only combinatorial is able to generate a very geometrical uh, structure. So we have work on different variation of this model with fitness, finding very interesting relation to quantum geometry, 
it's quantum statistics, but here I want to tell you about another aspect of this geometry which is related to dynamics, meaning, meaning the spectral property of this graph. So we, we, we decide to focus on the normalized Laplacian because we want to avoid this effect of the scale-free degree distribution and compare exponential and scale-free degree distribution. So we will have a, a Laplacian spectrum, which is, of course, um, uh, the, 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 the matrix is semi-positive defined, so the spectrum is positive and we have one eigenvalue which is zero, the system is connected, and then we have a, a clear signature of geometry, meaning that these networks do not have a spectral gap, but they have a spectral dimension, meaning that these eigenvalues are uh, growing like a power of lambda with a power that depends on this uh, uh, quantity, which is called the spectral property of, of the network. And interesting, the spectral property is no, the spectral dimension is known to be related to the Hausdorff dimension by this relation. So since this uh, Hausdorff dimension for our lattices is infinity, we will explore only spectral dimension greater than two. So we, uh, these are the objects that we study. We focus on the manifold. So for instance, again, remember this kind of holography of this structure. So we constructed them in 3D, but actually they can see and be projected in a lower dimension, D uh, equal to two, for instance, in this case. And we look at the cumulative distribution of the eigenvalue which follows this, uh, this scaling exponent, so from which we can measure the spectral dimension. So the spectral dimension is scaling like more or less like D, at least for dimension D2, 3, and 4. For higher dimension, there are some deviation. So these are like lattices. In lattices, the spectral dimension is the dimension of the lattice. So from this perspective, we can say that the diffusion is like in a lattice, but actually, surprisingly, if we look at the eigenvector and we look at in how many nodes these eigenvectors are localized, and we use here a participation ratio to measure that, here we have a network of 10 to the 4 nodes, and we measure uh, uh, roughly half of the eigenvalue localized in less than 100 nodes. So there are a lot of eigen modes that are localized in these um, communities in this structure that are that are very small. So this, for for this reason, we were interested to study the Kura model on top of this structure, and of course we have a phase which evolve in time with an internal frequency and the coupling, depending on this coupling constant sigma, and we measure the usual global order parameter. So, of course, I don't have to remember to this audience, but in, you know, in the infinite fully connected network, the order parameter goes from zero to diff value uh, different from zero in the synchronized phase. And when we uh, apply the, we, we simulate the Kuramoto model on this structure, we find this uh, strong dependence on the dimensionality of, of the ne uh, network that we have considered. So for instance, take dimension capital D equal to two. So we can distinguish between three phases, a uns unsynchronized phase here in the bottom, where the order parameter is essentially zero, a synchronized phase where we reach stationarity here, and then here a phase which has strong temporal fluctuation. So uh, this phase we call it frustrated synchronization, and actually while in capital D equal to one, we never reach the synchronized phase. Uh, this frustrated synchronization phase region has a um, dependence on the dimension of, of the simplicial complex that we look and shrink for higher dimension. But these are simulations made on finite uh, network. Then really we wanted to explore whether this phase, the synchronized phase, is thermodynamically stable. 
So we look at simulation of finite size effect going from 100 to 3,200 nodes, and we measure the average order parameter and the average standard deviation of the time series, and we find that the order parameter goes down in all the case, and the region in which we observe very large fluctuation increases with the network size. So actually, this points uh, to us that um, we might have an upper critical dimension, and then we have a um, spectral dimension, and then we have studied by studying the linearized model uh, of the Kuramoto model and to study the stability of the synchronized space, we were able to prove that the um, uh, fully, synchron the fully synchronized space is not thermodynamically stable for um, spectral dimension ds less or equal to 4. So since this uh, complex network manifold have in dimension d equal capital D equal to 3 as spectral dimension 4, this is uh, the state in which the system is marginally stable and can explain this dependence on the dimension that we we find experimentally uh, experimentally uh, in neuronal culture. But then we also looked at spatial fluctuation because this network has uh, interesting communities. So mm, you can have a community detected by main uh, uh, community detection algorithm, and we can look at the local order parameter defined only on the nodes in this community. And so if we look at this uh, order parameter, you see that the different community have very <coughs> different time series, series. Some they oscillate between synchronous and asynchronous state, and the frequency spectrum is also very, very different. So we have strong uh, spa spatial temporal fluctuation of this system, and finally, we look at the Eigen uh, modes. The Eigen modes are also um, very localized on community, so this explain this uh, spatial uh, fluctuation that we observe in the network. And moreover, we look, we did a bit, we mimic what is done in brain research, so we look at order parameter defined on community. These are 70 community, these are 30 community, and we measure the correlation between those, finding a very non-trivial pattern of, of, of connection, and then when we cross grain to 30 community, the system doesn't, know to a, doesn't go to a trivial fixed point, meaning that here there is a um, temporal dynamical organization at different scales. In the few minutes that remain, I want to tell you about uh, another line of research, uh, which is on percolation, and in particular on topological percolation. For this, um, for this problem, we consider the regular uh, hyperbolic network started from the links and you attach triangles iteratively, or you start with the triangle and you attach tetrahedra iteratively. And these are hyperbolic, and mainly these hyperbolic network are characterizing by having not one percolation transition, but two, the upper and the lower percolation transition. So if the probability of leaving intact uh, the, the, the nodes is P is less than the lower percolation transition, no infinite cluster exists. Above the upper percolation cluster, the cluster is, exists and is extensive, and in between there are several subextensive clusters. So here, like you know, um, the mathematician just studied the <coughs> giant component of a graph, and the physicist study nodes and link percolation, so they damage node and links. But then there is a notion of k connected of the graph meaning that, for instance, triangle can be connected to triangle through links. And here we have introduced topological damage. So we can damage node links and triangles in D equal to 2, or node links and triangle and tetrahedra in D equal to 3. So we can define 
a large set of generalized uh, topological percolation problems. For instance, the triangle percolation, triangles are removed with probability Q, and links are connected to links to inter-triangles. So in D equal to two, there is an interesting result by Boucher, Ziff, and Ziff that percolation also in bond percolation just becomes discontinuous. And here we generalize to D equal to three, and we look at triangle percolation. So these are, you know, these three initial links that can be connected with the triangle initially, or with triangles added at later generation. And we wrote the uh, RG equation, uh, which, uh, which can be, from which we can use some uh, multiplex uh, representation of the problem. And we find that the transition is uh, BKT, but it is the Kosterlings at Taurus. So just to, to tell you that, you know, this effect of dimension on the percolation property, so this is for D equal to two hyperbolic simplicial complex. You have that link percolation is discontinuous and all the other percolation transition are discontinuous. So here we expect all this percolation discontinuous. In uh, D equal to three, we have instead continuous link percolation, but triangle percolation is BKT and the other are discontinuous. So we find very strong effect of dimensionality, meaning that if we node, we know node and link percolation, we cannot predict the other percolation problems. So if we explore the percolation in 2D, uh, uh, we observe only this continuous phase transition, while in D equal to three, we observe continuous transition and also BKT. So there is a very strong effect of dimensionality uh, also in this topological percolation transition. So this leads to my conclusion. So we have seen three examples of problem defined on simplicial complexes in which we find a very important effect of dimensionality of the object. So uh, in particular, we focus on this network geometry with flavor and um, that uh, display emergent hyperbolic uh, network geometry, and we see the important effect of dimensionality on the degree distribution, on the effect of frustrated synchronization, and on topological percolation. Thank you very much for your attention. Ah, I, I forgot to say something, sorry. Uh, uh, these are say, collaboration and paper. This is entropy. Uh, is a, um, Advertisement is an open journal, uh, if you are an uh, open access journal that actually funded my travel here. And also we have, uh, we have about to launch uh, JFIS Complexity. This is another open access journal which for the first year accepts paper without publication charge. So submit your high quality paper there. Okay, thank you very much, Inestra. Um, time for some questions. Yes, Javier. Thank you, Inessa, for the talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the Kuramoto model in your networks. Uh, when you place a group of Kuramotos with heterogeneous frequencies in an heterogeneous network, you can define an alignment function to maximize synchronization. Uh, also, assortativity is very important and can induce explosive synchronization. So my question is, how did you place the Kuramoto in your networks? I mean, uh, there, was there a correlation be, between the frequency of the Kuramotos and, for example, no, it's, uh, it's completely at random. random. The frequency are random, Gaussian distributed. Okay. Uh, of course, the network have correlation. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. This, uh, hierarchical but I'm wor wondering if you, for example, define an alignment function or just a correlation between dynamical properties of the Kuramoto's and no? No, no, no. We did not have any correlation on degree or yeah. uh, the, the dynamics is totally But I think if, if you work on that, maybe you can see changes in the transition. Yes, probably, yeah. yes. And we are speaking also with uh, Stefano because maybe there is some adaptive way. And yeah, yeah, or induce it or reduce it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
this is again uh, this is my talk so active, yeah. uh, you said that you could not uh, embed the network into an Euclidean space and you had to go to a hyperbolic is there any specific reason why you choose hyperbolic and not any one yes so um, so this this embedding here which is the natural embedding on the wall right um, is a you can interpret this this one you can embed it as a Euclidean embedding but then you pay the cost that the links do not do not have equal length if you want mm -hmm. to have the links that have equal length all the space. Mm -hmm. okay it's just that I have a you don't know how much you know about Fisher information metric <laughs> Uh, but in Fisher information metric, the hyperbolic space comes from covariances. Mm -hmm. So, like, is a is a space of uniform covariances, as you say. Yes, I think this is not not strictly related to to Fisher geometry. But well, yeah. maybe we can talk after. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Inestra. Final speaker of the morning is Zoltan Toroshkai, uh, and he'll be speaking on computational hardness as chaos in an analog approach to Boolean satisfiability problems. Yeah, you can put it in the pocket there. And, and, and this is a little bit of a problem. Yeah, but uh, this. I'll let you know when you have five minutes left. Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh, oh HDMI doesn't work? Oh, okay. Directly on yours, no. Okay. I, I, at least I had the same problem with my Mac. So. Okay. Ah, is this, is this the correct? Uh, no, no, ah, no, not USB-C. It's uh, this one. It's this. Okay. So this doesn't work, really? Well, let's try again. Actually, yeah, it works, it works. Let's just take it. It disappears. Just disappears. Oh, it will disappear. It oh. happened already. It disappeared. Oh, God. <laughs> so so God. you don't move. Uh, uh, let's use VGA. Yeah, that, that works. Yeah. No, no, this one yeah, is, this is not the, the, the right. No, mine is, mine is an older version. <laughs> okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, just move the mic up. <coughs> oh, closer to my face? No, just the mic. Yeah, move oh. that mic. Yeah, that's it. Is it better? Okay. It's not better. Okay, let's hope it works this time. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about hardware as well, so it figures. Yeah. Okay, now, it's just slow. I never understood why electronics takes time to operate, uh, but it does. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. I apologize for the uh, difficulties here, technical difficulties. Actually, what I'm going to talk about is sort of a journey from theory to devices um, related to how can we try to solve um, hard optimization and constraint satisfaction problems using continuous time dynamical systems, being, this being a nonlinear dynamical systems conference. So this work was uh, sponsored by the NSF and several research corporations, semiconductor research corporations, IBM and Micron, under this Excel Extremely Energy Efficient Collective Electronics um, uh, project. And uh, sort of to give you the background, what I'm going to do is uh, um, talk about analog computing. And we all know that digital computers are now are kind of failing. Uh, they don't do well on hard computational problems, um, such as constraint satisfaction and optimization problems. 
but many, many applications would uh, benefit from that. I mean, daily industrial applications. And even when they do work uh, well, uh, when you compare them, how they work uh, compared to brain, uh, they also operate at a, at a much, much larger cost than biological counterparts. So you kind of need to think differently to address this problem. And two buzzwords come to mind. One is analog computing. The other is quantum computing. What I'm going to do is only talk about analog computing here. Um, and um, as a matter of fact, think of uh, special purpose computing instead of universal computers. That is, if you can uh, uh, build a physical device that is much more efficient than a regular computer on a class of problems that are important to solve for in industrial purposes, then uh, you have done something useful. So we, we don't, you can still use your uh, standard computer to write email and, and fill out spreadsheets. Okay? So what I mean by analog computation, uh, your system has um, uh, non-discrete, not zero and one, that would be a Turing machine, but uh, state variables that vary continuously in a range, uh, real values, and the system can update it, it, itself in discrete time or continuous time. It has a fairly long history, going back, actually the first computers that humans built uh, were analog computers, going back to uh, Shannon's uh, general purpose analog computer, and there have been a number of other uh, uh, proposed versions and variants later, but it lost to digital computing because digital computing could handle noise uh, of the devices much, much better, therefore co compute much more accurately. However, we had difficulty with the noise in the 50s, 60s, where the technology wasn't there to control noise. We now are able to control noise quite well at the nanoscale. So it, it, it's not a bad idea to go back and see what could we do with analog computing instead of digital computing. Um, I will also think of computing as a dynamics, a so, sort of dynamics, some kind of dynamical system. And if you read the definition of an algorithm from Wikipedia, it is nothing but a finite list of instructions that are applied iteratively from an initial state to a set of intermediate states until an end state is reached. By all intensive purposes, that's a dynamical system. So um, what I'm going to call um, a trajectory of the dynamical system is really the sequence of the states that the algorithm goes through. And I'll also be focusing only on deterministic algorithms, given some initial conditions, the, uh, knowing the system, of course, the, the rest, all the states are uniquely determined. Um, as I said, there are discrete time and continuous time. Uh, when you talk about discrete, discrete time analog algorithms, uh, the, right, uh, the equations really are dis, uh, dif, uh, difference equations. For example, deep neural networks, uh, the state of the system is described by the weights of all the edges, and those are updated at every uh, in discrete uh, time steps. Uh, or continuous time analog algorithms, this is the class I'll be talking about focusing on. These are ordinary differential equations that may contain parameters. You might even think of partial differential equations, but I'm using only ODEs. And you can think of sp spiking neural networks uh, in this case. Uh, well, what's being, uh, what, what the state variables are, or the continuous time interval between spikes, and they can change continuously, or coupled oscillator networks. In this case, the states, uh, uh, the state variables are phases also changing continuously. So, um, what computation is therefore in this in this uh, in this uh, framework is nothing but the evolution of the trajectory of a system towards an attractive fixed point, which represents the answer to your question. So that's how you would like uh, to set up your analog computer. You ask it a question, you let it run its algorithm, and then flow into some uh, state. And when you read off that state, you get your answer to your question. Of course, we don't know the answer. Otherwise, we wouldn't be searching for it. So the challenge is to design the right-hand side of your, of your system, uh, uh, this part, oops, right? This part, the right-hand side, such that um, such that there is such an attractive fixed point. If there is a solution to your original problem, uh, it appears an, as an attractive fixed point, and of course, you don't get stuck in other, other uh, uh, non-solution attractors either. So there are two approaches people take. Uh, one is you're given a physical computation primitive, such as, such as a neuron, um, and then the, the problem is figuring out the network of connections between the neurons such that all these conditions are satisfied. Uh, your computation converges the way it's converged to some, some steady state and, uh, uh, or coupled oscillators. Or you could do first principle-based design when you, um, 
when you have to come up with both the math and the hardware implementation at the same time. So that's what I'm going to talk about, both the, both the math and the hardware implementation. So uh, in particular, we're going to look at Boolean satisfiability problems. These are very fundamental problems in computer science. You have n Boolean variables, meaning that they take on the value 0 and 1, and you have m clauses. Each is a disjunction of k literals. That is one clause that is given, maybe looks like this, x3 or x, not x9 or x11. So this clause is true if and only if at least one of these literals is true. If uh, 2 is fine or 3 is fine, for example, x3 is 1, satisfies the whole clause. Uh, x9 is 0, satisfies the whole clause because this is not x9, right? And so on and so forth. So the task is to find an assignment to those variables such that all the clauses are satisfied. Now, um, it turns out that uh, you can use this conjunct in normal form because this is a theorem, propositional calculus that takes any logical expression. You can translate it into conjunctive normal form. So uh, you can formulate lots of decision or decision problems you can formulate with this language and try to uh, uh, do constraint satisfaction where uh, asking, for example, if there is a solution that satisfies um, your constraints or not. Schedule students between, between uh, uh, time slots and rooms and other, other constraints you might have, typically used in scheduling. Uh, it is known that if you have three or more variables for majority of the clauses, then it's empty complete, proved by Cook and Levin, which means that if you had an efficient three-set solver, then it would solve all problems in the uh, decision class efficiently. This is a very famous uh, uh, problem or theorem. Um, but of course, life doesn't always give you solvable problems. You might have constraints that you don't even know a priori, that they are conflicting head to head. You cannot satisfy them both at the same time. So in this case, you want to find the best solution in the sense that you want to maximize the number of satisfied clauses. That's why it's called max set or you want to minimize the number of unsatisfied clauses, okay? So uh, this is actually related to the P, uh, P versus NP question. The question is if all problems in the NP class, in the decision class, admit a polynomially fast algorithm, polynomially fast meaning the number of steps to solve on a digital computer is scarce polynomial in the number of variables. And it's actually one of the now six, it was seven, uh, uh, Millennium Prize problems by Leclay Institute it's uh, right here. The Poincaré conjecture was uh, solved by Grisha Perelman uh, a couple of years ago. So um, if you look at uh, uh, Lance Fortner's article, it's a very nice general uh, readership review of the status of the P versus MP problem. And he says that if P was equal to MP, actually very few people believe that these days. And you will see also, I'm going to show you some argument why that's, why that's not the case. Uh, it will make the whole internet look like a footnote in history. Of course, you would have perfect solutions for, for uh, all uh, optimization or, or constraint satisfaction problems, rather. Almost all optimization and, and constraint satisfaction problems. So uh, let's, let's take a different angle to this uh, set problem using continuous time dynamical systems. And what I'll do is I'll translate the 0 and 1 into minus 1 and plus 1 spin variables. And since I have n of them, I also allow these variables to vary continuously between minus 1 and plus 1. So basically, my dynamical system is living inside this n-dimensional hypercube with the uh, discrete values sitting at the corners of this dynamical system or this, uh, or this hypercube. So uh, what is important is that what I will have define a dynamics that runs in this hypercube and it switches as it runs, it switches from one orthant to the other. And once in, a, in another orthant, you can just check if the corner is a solution to your constraints or not. This is NP, which means that checking, if I give you a candidate solution to your constraint satisfaction problem, checking is fast. It's linear in the number of steps. You just plug it in and see which one doesn't work. Or if all works, then yeah, you have a solution. Okay, so this is important. That's what we, we're going to do. And uh, we're going to uh, in, now encode the set problems into an analog system or continuous time system by introducing first this matrix. This, this defines the problem. This matrix defines the problem. If a, a variable, let's see. Uh, okay, if a, if a variable or its negation is not present of a clause, so you are given these clauses, then the corresponding uh, matrix element is zero. If it's present in normal form, it's one. If it's in negated form, it's minus one. Okay. 
So uh, we're going to define the analog class one for every clause. This is now analog uh, uh, or continuous, varying between 0 and 1, the way it is defined. So if CMI, for example, is uh, 0 because the variable i is not part of that clause, then this is just multiplication by 1, doesn't do anything. If it's CMI is 1, it means that the variable is in normal form. You have 1 minus SI, and that's 0 only when SI is 1. When SI is 1, the variable is 1, which means it satisfies the class. So you can convince yourself that these analog class functions are 0, otherwise positive, if and only if the class is true. Now, um, we want to, of course, satisfy all of them, so we can introduce an energy-like function, which is basically a weighted sum of these uh, km squares, km squared to guarantee that the dynamic stays within the hypercube, and we have a proof for that. And the AMs are kept strictly positive. So in this case, V0 if and only if uh, all the clauses are satisfied. So we want to minimize, we, we, are, we want to find values S such that V0. Now the AMs, if I were to keep the AM variables positive, let's say all ones, then you would get stuck in uh, local minima which is typical of all search problems. So to solve that issue, these are called auxiliary variables. We're going to assign the dynamics to the AM variables as well. And this is the dynamics. So in S space, we have just simple gradient descent on this, on this energy landscape. But uh, the AM variables are coupled positively. They're growing exponentially uh, 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 with respect to KM. For every M clause, M clause you have uh, an AM dynamics defined like this. This seems a bit crazy because this is actually exponential dynamics. But the point is, if KM is zero because the system finds the solution, then the, the M over dt is zero, so it stops growing. Okay? So let's see uh, how we can interpret this a, a bit better. Well, I can formally eliminate the auxiliary variable from here and write it like this and plug it in to the expression of the potential. So now you see your potential is actually time dependent in this way. And uh, notice you have an exponential and an integral there from 0 to t. So the clause that has been unsatisfied the longest will uh, have a large e to the value, e to the integral t value. And this will overtake, dominate all the rest. Now if you pick that one clause and plug it into this equation, you can convince yourself easily the dynamics is such to drive that clause to satisfaction towards 0. But then some other term suddenly gets larger than this one that's being driven down, and then the whole cycle is repeated until all of them, if there is a solution, are pushed down to zero. So what you do is actually gradient descent on a globally time varying potential with focused search. The variation of the, the potential itself is coupled back to the search dynamics. That's the idea. So this is, this is a, these are the trajectories um, on some problem. This is a, a three-dimensional uh, uh, subspace of it, as you can see. It hardly goes through the middle. It, it kind of uh, sticks to the corners or the sides. Uh, or you can look at, let's look at some, some dynamics for solving Sudoku. In this case, you can take, Sudoku is also another uh, decision type problem. It's a discrete decision type problem. I assume everybody knows how Sudoku works. If not, let me know. So you have to fill in with digits from one to nine, such that you, you don't have multi, uh, a duplication of digits on any row or column or any of these three by three blocks. So you can translate this into a Boolean problem. And what I show here is how our solver solved Sudoku for uh, the world's, one of the world's hardest, actually this is considered the world's hardest Sudoku problem. Uh, it was designed by a mathematician from, from Finland. And we start with some, some random initial condition. You see 8, 8, 8 here. So this is really not good. But if I let, let this, humans cannot solve this. Uh, and if I have time at the end, I'll show you uh, a demonstration to uh, a, a human strategy using software that tries to solve this and is going to fail on it. So, and then, of course, it solves it and finds the right, right uh, solution. And these are what you see here are, are uh, every Boolean variable is represented by a color, basic, uh, sorry, every uh, integer is represented um, uh, by, a, by a, a nine Boolean variable. One is at the value which represents the integer and the rest are zero. So here, uh, the one uh, dominates against the others, the one that corresponds to the solution. So you can set this up. Now, let's look at solver performance, how well this does. And what we do here is we take a random tree set. Uh, and it, it, it has been shown that when the number of clauses uh, is in the right ratio with, the, with respect to the number of variables, 
at uh, 4.25, then it is very, very hard to find solutions uh, to set problems. Before, it's easy because you don't have many constraints. Afterwards, it's easy again because you have too many constraints, easy to find a conflict. So here is where, where really the NP completeness, hardness nature come, comes through. And if we monitor the fraction of problems after choosing randomly many, many problems that have not yet solved by continuous time t at the given constraint, uh, 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 constraint density, then we see that the fraction of uh, problems that have not yet been solved decreases exponentially, which means that the problems are solved quickly. So um, if I just write this down mathematically, I have uh, this expression that's shown here, and now I measure the decay rates, and the decay rates have polynomial scaling. If I combine the two, what I find that the time needed to miss not more than a pure fraction of the uh, uh, hard uh, uh, tree set problems chosen scales polynomially with the number of variables. So it means that the continuous time complexity is polynomial, where, where beta is about five thirds. Uh, then the referees actually wanted us to try everything, including the kitchen sink. So they, uh, they asked us to do very hard uh, um, CSPs, locally occupation problems, which are used for benchmarking, uh, uh, Sudoku, but Sudoku not nine by nine, but n by n. Uh, and when we try that, it, it, uh, it, it doesn't care too much about it. It, it solves uh, these problems as well. Uh, uh, it is to be noted that in, this, uh, in the frozen phase of, of uh, these, uh, of these uh, uh, set problems, even survey propagation and belief propagation fail. So um, I mentioned MaxSat, which is trying to find, for problems that don't, don't have uh, full satisfiability, uh, try to find, uh, try to minimize the number of unsatisfied clauses. So what we are going to, so I'm going to show you that if you modify this system, you can solve those as well. So here uh, we define the energy of the, at a given point in space, is uh, if I give a certain uh, set of S values, uh, some of the uh, clauses will be satisfied, some unsatisfied. So E of S is defined as the number of unsatisfied clauses. And uh, what we do is we monitor the probability that the trajectory has not found an orthod with an energy smaller than E. So when you look at those, you find that uh, also decreases exponentially. And this decay rate, uh, then when you plot it uh, as function of energy, which is the number of unsatisfied clauses, you can extrapolate that to the origin, and you find in this case that the best you can do with this is five, okay? So this, this was chosen, this is a very hard problem, chosen from, uh, uh, from a 2016 MaxSat uh, competitions, uh, where uh, this, this is the particular problem instance, 250 variables, 1,000 thousand clauses, and uh, our, you, you, we run this on an iMac, on, on any iMac, uh, and in about nine hours, we found a, a satisfying assignment. When we ran a, a, a computer science discrete MaxSat algorithm, which is complete and exact algorithm for over five weeks, we only reached equals nine. So it thinks completely differently than, than these discrete algorithms. And then the referees wanted us to, to compare this for all possible problems, for all the problems that were posted uh, at, this, at this competition, 454 MaxSat problems. So uh, the pluses are over as overall best competition solver. Some solvers did well on some problems, not, not so well on others. We choose the best for that problem, and we compare it with ours. And, and uh, uh, in terms of the minimum energy uh, um, uh, assignment found, and, and it, it tracks uh, very nicely the best competition solver. So it's competitive with those as well. Okay? Now, an interesting application is MaxSet, uh, uh, application of two Ramsey numbers. I don't know if you. Oh, oh, so I have five minutes, so maybe I'll skip this, or I'll actually just say this very, very quickly. Uh, it's a coloring problem of the a complete graph with two colors, and you want to color it such to avoid creating monochromatic k clicks or monochromatic triangles, for example. So for, 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 uh, for k3, this is easy to prove that it's six. For five, you find a solution. For, for six, every node has uh, five neighbors, but you have two colors, means there has to be three neighbors. You have to connect with the same color, maybe blue. So if I have uh, 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 these three blue edges, I have to put there a, a red, otherwise I made a blue monochromatic triangle, which I want to avoid. Here I'm also forced to make a blue, uh, a red. Here I'm also forced to make a red, and I just made a red monochromatic object triangle of red, right? So which is red, which is not good. 
So um, you can transfer it into a Boolean set, and it becomes a K choose two set problem. And for R equals four, and we use our algorithm, of course, when it's unsatisfiable, it's a max set problem. Uh, the theory says that it's 18, but uh, um, um, also our algorithm shows nicely that, that these all extrapolate to under zero, uh, all these above extrapolate to above zero. So uh, for k equals five, this is an open question. Turns out, uh, for example, for n equals 35, you have about 10 to the 338 uh, possible coloring, so the space is huge uh, for coloring, uh, possible colorings. Uh, but it finds a solution for n equals 42, which is the last n value that anybody has ever found a coloring. You have 861 variables and more than 1.7 million clauses. We, we, we find those, but for 43, we, we, uh, we find a lowest energy coloring, which no one has ever reported before, uh, with two monochromatic uh, uh, um, pentagons uh, or five clicks sitting on six nodes. And these are the corresponding solutions. I mean, you can go and check these. Uh, so why does it work? Well, it works because the system that we designed because of this exponential acceleration is hyperbolic. It doesn't have KM tori, it doesn't have sticky set, set uh, from any domain that doesn't have in, uh, a solution or an attractive fixed point, which is a solution. It will, the trajectories escape exponentially fast. So we know that the escape rate is the dynamical invariant of the system. It doesn't depend on your, your initial conditions or anything like that. What is also important for device uh, uh, implementations is that this hyperbolicity provides uh, something called omega stability. If you perturb a little bit your system, if you do this with transistors, some transistors have different parameters, it doesn't matter, the whole phase space just gets uh, distorted uh, a, a little bit, but the invariant objects stay the same. Uh, we have shown that our system is hyperbolic, and when the problems are hard, the dynamics is chaotic, as you have seen in those, those, those slides. And therefore, this has to be transient chaos. And we talked about here in this paper, we talked about how this chaos appears. It appears through a phase transition, second order phase transition at some alpha value for random set. And in this case, of course, you have a chaotic repeller that's characterized by kappa. So uh, Olivier Bournet says that uh, you can't use time as a complexity measure for, for these uh, autonomous systems because you can always integrate time out or, or rescale such that everything looks very fast, and he's absolutely right. So <laughs> according to his definition, an OD solver is efficient or smart if it generates poly-length trajectories, if the length of the trajectory generated scales polynomially. And that's the case for our uh, CTDS. Uh, as shown here, we also measure the scaling of the length of the trajectory generated by the solver. Does this mean that P equals MP? No. Because what happens is what you did is, uh, even though you have an, uh, um, a polynomial time, analog polynomial, uh, polynomial analog time solver or continuous time solver, you're using unbounded variables, which means if those variables are current or voltages, you're going to be uh, uh, um, uh, having an exponential uh, fluctuating energy cost to it. But I don't know about you, but other than waiting for it, I don't know how to generate time. I know how to generate energy. So this is actually useful for critical applications. And in some sense, what you're doing is we are, we are, we are shifting, moving ourselves, uh, however it's convenient, on some kind of energy time limiting envelope, which nobody knows what it is. So maybe you can figure it out. Okay, um, and there is another reason that, that uh, analog is actually uh, might have usefulness uh, or continuous time dynamical systems is because the sequence of, of integers, if I just read in which order the trajectory is found, I put the whole thing in the black box, I'm not telling you what's in the black box, you're not gonna be able to easily come up with, a, with an algorithmic standard computer science algorithmic thinking to reproduce uh, that, that sequence of integers or zeros and ones that's coming out uh, from, from the black box hiding an, an, an ODE solving this. So in some sense, it's a novel family of, uh, of, of solvers uh, thinking in a novel way, and uh, it's expected that uh, it will do better than digital uh, uh, solvers, uh, at least on some classes of problems. So there are some observations that make it easy to, to implement or easier to implement into uh, uh, devices. It has no scale, so it's up to you what is the smallest scale. Of course, noise will dictate that. It's the smallest RC value. It's an RC uh, system. 
um, and the right hand side is polynomial, memory and processing are co-located. There is no uh, bus shuttling information between a processor and the, and the storage. There's no storage. The equation itself is its own storage. So uh, we have uh, recently finished, uh, with jo collaboration with Georgia Tech, a, a circuitry for this. These, uh, these are the various elements. The branches are the clauses as they are implemented in the circuitry. And uh, uh, testing with H5 simulators, which are industry standard electronic circuit simulators, show that um, solves problems on, on the order of nanoseconds. And I'd like you to take a look here. So uh, this is our solver. It takes on the order of nanoseconds versus milliseconds uh, um, by a digital state of the art uh, 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 mini set, state of the art set solver on, run on digital processor. So we have a speed up of 10 to the 4th. Uh, well, by the time you, you implement this in, in, in the real world, which we did, uh, you're probably going to have a, a speed up of maybe 1,000 to 100, but even that is very, very valuable. So we just received back last week the chip from the foundry. It uh, has an area of 2.2 times 2.2 square, square millimeters, and uh, we are now going to embed this into a, into a backboard, into a motherboard, basically, and, and, and start the testing. So what I, uh, these are the uh, sort of the conclusions. Uh, I think there is still a lot of low-hanging fruit going back and thinking in an analog or continuous time or uh, nonlinear non dynamical systems way in solving these problems um, because of uh, lack of von Neumann bottleneck, uh, parallelism, and of course you have now a larger continue, a spectrum of continuous time dynamical algorithms you can, you can pick from. Um, of course, you have to understand the precision performance cost relationship on which we, we recently made some progress that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll publish soon uh, because this is useful because the shown solver is not unique. You can come up with other dynamical systems. And as I said, you can use the theory of dynamical systems to develop a computational complexity theory for these uh, basically computers. So uh, of course, you'd like to also design complete analog algorithms, complete in the sense that they also can tell you if there is no solution that is formulate class conflicts in analog. And my last comment is that the fact that, uh, uh, so when you have, let's say, an MP complete or MP hard problem, and you try to solve that, uh, you at least have to have a nonlinear uh, system. Uh, if the problem can be solved by a linear system, the problem has linear structure. Those are not hard. We know how to deal with linear. If the problem is nonlinear, and nonlinearity uh, has, a, has the nature that that um, it, uh, it, it uh, generates entropy. That is because of the separation, exponential separation of trajectories. Uh, it has entropy production, much like Boltzmann's each theorem, which says that, um, which indeed supporting the observation that uh, once you have a solver designated to solve hard problems, it will have to be nonlinear, nonlinearity, the, uh, the trajectory, any algorithm is a trajectory during the solution process uh, will, will generate entropy and the trajectory can get lost in an exponential large uh, search space and therefore um, impeding you to solve it in a, in a polynomial uh, time scale, the problem. Uh, so so this, this makes a, a good case for thinking of P not equal MP as really a manifestation of the second law of thermodynamics. You cannot avoid it. But as we have seen, uh, uh, the potential is still there to exploit what between Turing machines and this envelope and this hard wall that is imposed on us by the second law of thermodynamics. Just like in case of Shannon theorem, capacity theorem, that says that you can transmit information uh, up, to, up, to, um, um, up to a certain uh, capacity, the cap uh, Shannon's capacity theorem uh, between two points uh, given, given a noisy channel in between the two. You know, there is a, there's a certain limit that you can achieve. That's missing for, for computing as well, which is still very similar to uh, information uh, submission or transportation. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, just curious, um, nonlinear systems have this problem of being sensible also for noise. Yes. And also multi-stability. So how can you think? This can affect. Yeah. So, so as I said, you need to have a, you need to have a, a, a hyperbolic system. If the system is hyperbolic, then because of this omega stability, 
uh, you can perturb the system, its, it's uh, invariant structure doesn't change. So there's, of course, there's always, if you have too much noise, your computation is gone. And actually, that's the problem. So we have, I'm not showing it here, but there is a relationship between the accuracy that you have to ensure in your computation and, and um, the, uh, the metric entropy of the dynamical system and the escape rate. It's a nice relationship that if you don't satisfy, then, uh, then you have a higher chance of not finding the solution. That's you know, in a different talk, but I can show it to you afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Omega stability. Yes, hyperbolic systems have, have omega stability. Okay, there's another oh. question here, Murillo. Yes. My, my question is, I was connected to Christina and maybe others. Uh, a hyperbolic system is very easy to be broken uh, by perturbations of parameter alterations, especially when you go higher dimension. It's difficult to preserve high dimensionality for a general system. Uh -huh. and, and the other point is uh, you require that uh, you have an equilibrium point as a solution for, for your state. And this means negatively upon of exponents, but... No, 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 it's, it's, uh, the system is, uh, has transient chaos. You do have, uh, you do have what is called, uh, you, you do have, uh, you, you have attractors fixed points. But when it's away from the attractors, the dynamics is chaotic. Uh, your, your, uh, st steady state behavior is, once it enters the, the, the right orthant, it just goes through it forever. So. It can be chaotic. Yeah, but it's chaotic elsewhere, away from. So you can have, this is well known in dynamical systems theory, that you have attractors. But before the, uh, a trajectory is started from anywhere, reaching those attracting fixed points or attractors, the dynamics is or can be chaotic if you have a chaotic repeller uh, uh, away from those. Well, the energy city is unstable. The dynamics has to be unstable, otherwise unstable. Uh, it's not going to do unstable. Yes, otherwise it's not going to do any such dynamics. That's the whole point. But this is transient chaos. This is transient chaos. So eventually you find it. Just the same way. This is actually um, experiments done in uh, uh, I forget who's. Oh, I can I can find you the, the reference in turbulence. They have the, they take a long pipe, 30 meter long pipe, and they they pump turbulent fluid uh, at one end. And eventually, the, the fluid will find its steady state solution of the Navier-Stokes equation, which is a, 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 a parabolic velocity profile. But before it does that, there is this transiently chaotic. But yes, in dynamics is, is, yes, is convergent. Exactly. Which exactly. means put a negatively up on exponents. Uh, nearby, nearby those solutions. <laughs> I think you have to get very close to the solution, then you are attracted to it. But until you get there, it's completely chaotic. Yes, it, it, is, it is well known in uh, the theory of nonlinear dynamical systems. Okay. Uh, one more question. Is it, you have a, a, so, a, so stability. Look, the, the, this, is, this is what you see. You had also a question of stability, right? So what we did is we varied the, the sizes of the transistors that implement this equation. Uh, we added 5% variability when we put it together. And the solutions are, 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 are moving together. Of course, if you add too much, then it's going to fall apart. <laughs> If I understood the difference between this usual deep learning and machine learning approaches and yours There's is no that you're here. more specific, right? You're more problem focused. Yes? And yes. The other ones are more yes, general. it is uh, uh, problem focused and there is no network. My question is not how to design the network, but it's rather how to design a dynamical mm -hmm. system in some, some high dimensional space mm -hmm. to, find, uh, to find a solution. Oh. It's different. Thank you very thank much, you. Zoltan and Janestra and Nilima. Thank you. Uh, to all. We now break for lunch and reconvene at 2. Christina will share. Thank you. I've been also a little worried about how do you get this? How do you, you know, if your algorithm doesn't have a fixed solution. Yes, then, then what it does, it, it still, the way it's designed, it still wants to, uh, to um, drive all